in the midst of all the international conflict you reign in the midst of afghanistan you reign lord the song says we trust you lord may that word continue to ring in our lives over and over again the bottom line can we trust you in all of this you are sovereign you reign and all of these things are moving towards a desired end your purpose your will and lord in the meantime we know that you will not delay everything is now moving according to its own perfect time and when that time comes it will happen no matter what and so lord teach us to accept the fact that we are human beings with finite minds we cannot fathom what you're doing that leaves us only one thing to continue to enthrone you for you belong yes you have never left your throne you never will because you are god and we are not we give you praise in jesus name Amen and amen. Good morning. Good morning. Ang balaan ay stupid mo. Good morning. All right. Bring. Did you bring your Bible? Open your Bibles now. To John chapter three. Are you enjoying the series on the sovereignty of God? Okay, I believe with all my heart. As we move closer and closer to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, we don't know when, but at least we are moving closer one day at a time. I believe that the sovereignty of God. Will be accepted more and more by many people. How can you ever face all of these things happening without having an understanding of the sovereignty of God? Here's what you must do. Think about this: whatever that you are facing today, whatever we are facing today, international conflict. Afghanistan, all of this crisis going on. You have your national conflict, and all the political maneuvers are being made. Maybe your internal conflict. Here's what you must do: you take away the sovereignty of God from that equation. You will not make it. You are now probably today disappointed. You are frustrated. You are discouraged because you are not putting the sovereignty of God on on top of it. Kakasan yung bla, kwaan yung ang sovereignty sa ginoo in your life. You will try to understand everything. You will try to argue everything. You will try to put meaning in everything. You will try to put speculations in everything. Wow. In other words, daw mapaktan mo git bala anong dason. And it's not only that you're trying to outguess the Lord. Maybe the, the Lord will do this. Maybe the Lord pakot mo git ang Ginoo. That's the reason why when you cannot fathom the mind of God, you are so frustrated today. You have lots of fear. But when you put the sovereignty of God over everything, you can have rest in your soul. Amen. My goal in this series is to put that rest in your soul, and to have that contentment and joy that, okay, these things are happening according to God's plan. And so, the important thing is, how am I going to respond to all of these things? And so, let's begin. I am going to do something today. That is probably the most debated issue in Christianity. The most debated issue for years and years until today, 
This is about the sovereignty of God and the human responsibility. How can we ever reconcile them? Can you reconcile on one side the sovereignty of God? And at the same time, can you reconcile our own human responsibility? Answer me. Do you believe in God's sovereignty? Do you believe that you have also a free will? Do you believe that you have a free will? Truly? So, you have God's sovereignty over here. You have your own human responsibility over here. Next question. Can you reconcile them? Okay, let's see. <laughs> Lord, this is a very difficult study of your word. But again, Holy Spirit, God, allow me to communicate only what you want me to communicate and nothing more. In Jesus' name I pray. Turn your Bibles to John chapter 3. We are going to read verses 1 to 10. John writes, Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. A Pharisee, you know what is a Pharisee already. They were a member of that elite group of students of the Old Testament. They almost like memorized the Old Testament. And not only that, they believe that by being a Jew qualifies them to heaven. They believe that because they were circumcised, they qualifies them to heaven. They believe that by following all the 614, I think, or 13 rabbinic laws, which they made themselves, qualifies them to heaven. In other words, they believe that they can earn their way to heaven by doing the things that they used to do. They have ceremonies, they have rituals, they have sacrifices, and all of these things. They believe that. And... Nicodemus was part of that. Something was happening in the heart of Nicodemus. Why? This is all about religion. And when you have religion in your life and not a relationship with God, you are going to come empty. You will have full of doubts. You will have anxiety. You don't trust the Lord because you trust in your own effort, in your own strength. You don't have the assurance of salvation. So that was happening to Nicodemus. Remember, he was the master teacher. Tradition also says that Nicodemus was probably one of the wealthiest rabbi during the time. And so it says, this man came to Jesus by night. Obviously, he doesn't want people to see him. And then he addresses Jesus, Rabbi, teacher. That means you are a teacher. I am the master teacher. We are on that same level. But it seems that he is going to say something that will put Jesus higher than him. We know that you have come from God as a teacher. For no one can do these things that you do unless God is with him. Okay, he was trying to tell Jesus something here. You have something that I don't have. You can teach, I can teach, but you can perform miracles. I have not seen a miracle. I have not done any miracles. So you must be somebody. You must come from God. So he's trying to open up. You know, when you are the master teacher, if you are like Nicodemus, and you are empty because of your religion, you need some answers. And so he went to Jesus and he was trying to say, you are a different kind of teacher. You, there must be something in you. And of course, Jesus being Jesus knew the emptiness of his heart. In other words, Nicodemus, you are looking for meaning. You are looking for purpose. You are looking for the real truth. 
which you cannot find in all of your teaching. And Jesus right away said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Straightforward. Jesus did not go left and right because he knew right away what was in the heart of Nicodemus. And he said, Nicodemus, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Of course, Nicodemus did not understand it. And this is what he said. How can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born. Can he? Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you for the second time, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Wow. So still, he cannot understand what Jesus was saying. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. What was Jesus saying here? You know, flesh can only produce flesh. Flesh can never produce the spirit. But Jesus is saying that which is born of the spirit is spirit. It has to be the work of the Holy Spirit and not of the flesh. Do not be amazed that I said to you, again for the third time, you must be born again. Do you think Nicodemus understood it? No, he did not. And then Jesus has to give an analogy. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So is everyone born of the Spirit. There you go again. Nicodemus said to him, how can this be? And the answer of Jesus is saying, are you the teacher of Israel? Are you the master teacher of all of this? You should know these things. You don't understand these things. What was happening here? First of all, five times, a reference to being born again has been made by Jesus. Born again, born from above, or born from the Spirit. What was this all about? This is the doctrine of regeneration. So what is Jesus saying? Simple. Jesus is saying that for anyone, including you, Nicodemus, to enter the kingdom of God, he's talking about heaven, he's talking about eternal life, he's talking about the forgiveness of sin, that person must be born again, or that person must be born in the spirit. That person must be born from above, meaning it is a supernatural work of the Holy Spirit. Hmm. Again, let's simplify that. The whole point that Jesus was saying is this, Nicodemus, if you really, really want to go to heaven, something must happen to you that you don't participate in. Why? Because an understanding, Nicodemus, he has to be a part. He has to have a contribution as he goes to heaven. So an EIA is all about the work system. All this time, that was his learning. And not only that, all this time, that was his teaching that you must contribute as you go your way to heaven. And the Lord said, sorry, it does not happen that way. In fact, if you've noticed the verses, Jesus never said, there is a formula, Nicodemus, Formula number one, number two, number three, and number four. Then you will be born again. No, he says no. You just have to be born again. That's a statement of fact. It's not even a command. You must be born again. Verse eight. In other words, the kingdom of God is only for people who have been given the life of God. If you don't have the life of God, you are not born again. If you uh, do not have the life of God, you cannot be in the kingdom of God. As simple as it can be. In other words, unless 
It is the work of the Holy Spirit. And let it is a supernatural work of the Holy Spirit. Nicodemus, you cannot live in the kingdom of God. Something must happen to you apart from you contributing to your salvation. Of course, mabudlay na, no? We can try to understand the case of Nicodemus being a Pharisee. That's not his orientation. And for many of us here, we used to belong to a faith that believes this kind of thing, that we can earn our way to heaven, that we can buy our way to heaven by our good works, by our ritual, by the ceremonies, all of these things, almost the same with the with Nicodemus. And so Jesus has to give an analogy. The reason that Jesus is giving an analogy, because Nicodemus being a master teacher, they all use analogies, say ilang teaching, ilang na style. And Jesus is going to use that style nila so that he can understand. And he said, the analogy is this, Nicodemus, let's talk about physical birth. Physical birth is very simple. Physical birth is very basic. Everybody understands it. You do not participate in your own physical birth. When you were born, you had anything to do with it? The answer is no. You were just born. You had nothing to do with it. And for the same reason, Jesus is saying, Nicodemus, can you understand this? Let's talk about spiritual birth. If you had nothing to do with your physical birth, you have nothing to do with your spiritual birth. Same thing, same thing. You had no role in your physical birth. In the same way, Nicodemus, you have no role in your spiritual birth. That's the point of the analogy. In other words, again and again, Jesus was saying, Nicodemus, the kingdom is only for people who knows 100% that it's all a divine miracle and you have to forfeit all your efforts to participate. In other words, that's the kingdom of God. And that is available only to people who are born from above by a creative act done by God in which you do not participate. This is all the work of God. It is all the work of God. I have a question for you. Do you believe that when you were born again, it was all a work of God? Amen. How would you react if you were Nicodemus? A legalist of all legalists. I'm sure nagsiling siya, oh, you must be kidding. I spent my entire life believing this. That I can contribute to my salvation. Look, look at me. But then he was empty. That's why he was looking for meaning. Everything. Oh, wow. You can just imagine ang ilang aginahimo sa temple and all of the goodness that they're doing. And they're feeling, I must be nearer and nearer to heaven. And all of a sudden, that collapses in front of Jesus. And Jesus is saying, Nicodemus, it's zero. Nothing. Everything that you have believed is nothing. It cannot earn your way to heaven. All the accumulated religion, all the accumulated morality, all the accumulated human goodness that you have done, zero, zero, Nicodemus, it's meaningless. Boom. I'm sure he was stunned. Verse 6. That which is born of the Spirit is Spirit. It has to be the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit. Then he gives them another analogy. The first was birth. The second analogy, base by this time, may inchindihan ni Nicodemus because he was the master teacher. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it but do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So everyone who is born of the Spirit, okay? Do you understand this, Nicodemus? Why? What's about the wind? Can you control the wind? No. Can you control the Holy Spirit? No. Look, the wind blows somewhere here. The next time it will blow there. The next time, big toe. 
and I cannot even command the wind to blow this way, blow this way. I cannot. I, I cannot. It's all of God. It's completely and totally the sovereign work of God. I cannot see the wind. Can you see the wind? You cannot see the wind. Can you see the Holy Spirit? No. It's uncontrollable. It is irresistible, unpredictable. You can't. And so Jesus was saying, that's exactly what I mean, Nicodemus. It's the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. And trying to tell these things to somebody who is educated, supposed to be learned, smart, he cannot understand. Why? This is what we call the irresistible grace of God. This is all about grace. And John chapter 5, verse 21, just to summarize this, I can move on and on, but we will just summarize this. The Son gives life to whomever He will. That's His choice. That's His choice. John 5, 21. So He, he tries to summarize it. The Son gives life to whoever He will. So what do you call this? Verses 1 to 10. Chapter 3 of John, 1 to 10, this is very, very clear. This is about the sovereignty of God. It is about the sovereignty of God, okay? Verses 1 to 10. Now we settle that. Very, very clear. It's all of God. It's all about the Holy Spirit. There's nothing you can do. It is all of God. There's nothing that you can contribute. Now we are going to move on to the next 10 verses, 11 to 21. Verily, verily, I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. A very clear indication that Nicodemus still did not accept what Jesus was saying about the new birth. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? You cannot understand the analogy of the birth. You cannot understand the wind. How can I ever raise the issue about spiritual things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. He's talking about the crucifixion now. Now watch this in verse 15. That everyone who, who, everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. The famous verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes, whoever believes. In him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Believe, believe. 17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Verse 18. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already. You stand judged already. Because they have not Believe in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, that's Jesus, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever, there's the whoever again, lives by the truth, comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. John 3, 1 to 10, it's about the sovereignty of God. John 3, 11 to 21, five times, I think, he said, believe, 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 believe. What does it mean? The theme now is all about, the theme is about, Believing, which means it's faith. It's faith. Where are we moving now? We are now moving in what the reformers would say, sola fide. 
What is sola fide? It's the doctrine of salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. How many of you believe that? By grace alone, say yes if you believe. Through faith alone, in Christ alone, praise the Lord. What is this? Ephesians chapter 2, 8 and 9. By this time, you must memorize this. For by grace you have been saved through, and that is not of yourself. It's a gift of God. See that? It's not by works. It's not by works. It's by faith alone. Romans 3.20, no one is justified by behavior, by the deeds of the law. No one. It's all by faith. Romans 4.3, Abraham is justified by faith and not by works. Romans 10, 9, 9 to 10, one is saved by believing in the resurrection of Christ and acknowledging his lordship. And more, 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 and more. I can give you more. We don't have the time. Very clear. The word of God is crystal clear. In fact, Hebrews 10, the just shall live by faith, meaning it's faith alone. It's not by faith plus works, which other people believe. It's faith alone. What am I saying? John chapter 3, 1 to 10 is the sovereignty of God. Without any transition, without any explanation, Jesus shifts immediately to human responsibility. You have your choice. Whoever believes, who will make the choice? Whoever believes, who will make the choice? This is human responsibility. This is God's sovereignty over here. Wow. What is that? I know that many of you are now forming the formula in your mind. What is this? How can you reconcile this? But this is consistent with John's purpose. John chapter 20, verse 21. This has been written so that you may believe, meaning the entire gospel. You may believe that Jesus is the Christ. Do you believe that? That he is the Son of God? And that believing you may have life in his name. Very, very consistent here. Very. It is by faith alone. By faith alone. So again, kung basahon mo siya, 10 verses, the sovereignty of God. 10 verses, human responsibility. And you are trying to address somebody, Nicodemus, a Pharisee, who had a very defective uh, understanding of how to get to heaven. And Jesus was trying to Tell him the truth. You want to know the truth? This is it. Truly, 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 truly. So every time that Jesus is saying truly, that means in contrast to the error that you believe all your life, this is the truth if you have to be born again. It is of the Holy Spirit. It is of God. At the same time, you have your own human responsibility over here. So paano mo na siya? Paano mo na siya irreconcile? But that's exactly what Jesus did. Without any explanation, he went straight. It's a monologue. In other words, what Jesus was saying, anyone can be saved if he believes. My question is, did you believe? At the same time, you have to understand the doctrine of divine sovereignty. So... He gives us a warning, and he gave even Nicodemus a warning. If you don't believe, you will be condemned. If you don't believe, you will be judged. Which means that if you don't believe, you are responsible for your unbelief. And if you don't believe, you are going to be held responsible, guilty, and punished. What do you call this? Human responsibility. So you have to believe, and believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, you will not perish. You will have eternal life. Wow. Paano naman? I have my own human responsibility to believe. 
and I will bear the full weight of judgment if I refuse to believe. At the same time, over here is the sovereignty of God. It's all the work of the Holy Spirit. It's a supernatural work. So that's the presentation of Jesus to Nicodemus, verses 1 to 10 and 11 to 21. Ang pamangkot, how do you fit it together? How can salvation be solely a work of God and me be held responsible for believing or not believing? Has it ever occurred to you, ini ng mga issue? Anyway, God is in control. Anyway, gintawag yaku. Anyway, gintilek yaku. Anyway, I am predestined. I'm going to relax. Anyway, hindi tana lang nasla ishiran sa gospel kung gintawag nasla gintawag na sila. Well, it's also in the Bible there. So why? Sh- How can you reconcile these two? <laughs> Kabudlay. I have to contend with this that on one side there is God's sovereignty. On one side, there is that human responsibility. If I'm not going to believe, I will be held responsible for that. So you come to me and say, Pastor Joe, paano mo ni siya irreconcile? You want me to answer? I'm going back to my childhood days. Forty years ago, may mga release all the way from Bacolod, Morsha, and the travel na siya pakalto sa Capitolville, all of that, kato sa Talisay, and all they're going to say, there's a railroad track. And every day I can see mga bagon, train, passing by. When it is summer, we can play. And when you play on those railroad tracks, you can see two parallels of those railroad tracks. And it seems that they intersect somewhere at a distance. But when I go nearer to that distance, the same thing. Galaba, alaba. They never intersect the railroad tracks. When I was making this, I said, Do amo amo. And for as long as I am here on earth, this is my stand. These two biblical truths of God will always be parallel to me. They will never come together they will never intersect. They will never be diminished. They are what they are. That's just the way it is. Kung kamo magkanta sina. So I have to contend with myself. Rather than spending and wasting time, nga padalum-dalum kugidni, trying to understand the mind of God. And the more I try to understand the mind of God, the more I cannot. So I have to contend with my inability that I cannot harmonize these two. And it will only be a reflection of me being a man compared to God. So I'm happy with that. I am happy with that. So if you come to me and say, let's debate who is true here, God's sovereignty or human responsibility? And if you take one side and you say, ah, I just believe in the sovereignty of God, you don't have a free choice. If you say, I have a free choice, I don't believe, ibu na ya. But for me, I cannot harmonize the mind of God in these things. So my goal here is for you also to come to a point in your life Rather than wasting the time in argument and debate who is who is right, ang ako niya is, in my heart there is peace. These two biblical truth will always run parallel. You know why? God's sovereignty is very clear in the word of God. How many of you believe the sovereignty of God? Say amen! And how many of you believe that you have a human responsibility? You have to say amen because you have a free choice. How are you going to reconcile them? Let God be God. Akunya, the more I dig into the word of God and I can see the sovereignty of God, especially now, you know, South Gun, all I need to do, this is happening in Afghanistan. 
They just killed about 200 of the Christians. They were martyred a few days ago. All I need to do is to put the sovereignty of God on top of it. Could I take away the sovereignty of God? Where is this thing going on? Why? What is happening? I said, Lord, you are sovereign over Afghanistan. You are sovereign over the life of those Christians who were killed a few days ago. Now, let's talk about the human responsibility over here. Those Christians who were martyred a few days ago, about 200 of them, they also made their own choice. You know what they said? You, you received that? You know what they did? They called their friend through telephone and he says, Thank you for your prayers. We feel the supernatural work of God. We have now the boldness to face the enemy. And we have the boldness to continue to share the gospel. And then they heard gunshot, pang, 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 pang. And that was the end. They also made their own choice. They also made their own choice. But no matter what happens, they will not stop sharing the gospel to the Afghans. That was a choice and they died for it. Why? Jesus is sovereign. Whatever conflict that you are going into right now in your life, personal conflict, you put the sovereignty of God. For example, uh, I will quote Brother Kako. Sorry, Brother Kakdinka. Last week we were there and he said, whether na vaccinate ko or wala ko na vaccinate, it does not matter. Because if I die, it will not be because na bakunahan ko or wala ko na bakunahan. If I ever die, it will be because God at that time wanted me to die. Sakto man? So, nga ang pagsagad ta debate. Nabakunahan ka, patay ka gid. Nga ako, wala ka na patay ka man. Amo man ng Yapon, sakto gid siya. Sakto hindi. Thank you, Brother Kako. I will add you into the scriptures. But the point, practical. Nga ang pagsagad ta ni Lali Galalis kita. When God is sovereign, what, for example, Masilinko? Hey guys, let's all go to Dumaguete. Gusto mo? Let's have a road trip. Dumaguete. Some of you will say, I will take the northern route. Be a Sagay. Enjoy the ride. Some of you will take the Sagay route, the Sam, the Sipalay route. Enjoy. Some of you will take DSB. Some of you will take Mabinay. Enjoy the ride. Ang importante, we all see each other where? Dumagete. Different ways. Hebrews 9.27, it is what? Appointed unto man to die once. Ang punta ta sini, patay man tagyapun. So if you want to go there by vaccination, enjoy the ride. If you want to go there without being vaccinated, ano? enjoy the ride. So what's the point now? The point is, our God is a sovereign God. Whatever is happening in Afghanistan, God is sovereign. He's allowing this to happen because it is moving towards the desired end of God that he is coming soon. And for him to come soon, darkness has to escalate. That's the reason why Jesus has to come. And so for him to come, darkness must come. Terrible times must come so that Christians must desire the coming of Jesus. Because if Jesus will not come, darkness will dominate us. Dapat ginahandom tagid si Jesus maabot na. In the meantime, we're here. So instead of quarreling each other, let's do what God wants us to do. Do I hear an amen? I will not change the scriptures. I will not tamper the Bible. I am happy because it is there. 
I cannot harmonize it. I cannot bring it together. I cannot solve your dilemma. And I will not solve the dilemma. For me, it is a paradox, whatever it is. So what am I going to do? I'm going to try to make you as comfortable as you can with your inability to understand the mind of God. I'm happy with that. I want you to put your heart at rest and stop fighting each other and trying to prove who is who is right. It's almost like by the time we all get to do Maguete, may insist ka, sakto gito yang amon biya si palay. Masilim na sakto gito yang DSB kaya nami to yang dalan. Sakto, it's not a matter if you're right or wrong. What is important, we all see each other where? In do Maguete. Are we going to see each other in heaven? So, enjoy the ride. I know, I know. This is a big pill to swallow for some people because of their human pride. Ang gusto ginila ya in chindihon, baya antaka. If you want a debate, masiling ka. I take this side, masiling ko, gapati mangkus na. Masiling ka, I take this side, masiling ko, gapati mangkus na. Tek na no karon. Hallelujah. Enjoy the ride. I'll give you an example. I can give you lots and lots of example, but time constraint. Turn your Bibles to Isaiah 10. Let's look at this in a different angle. That God is sovereign. Probably this can help us. God is God. He does whatever He wants to do. Nobody can thwart the purposes of God. He has a he does what he wants to do. He is God. He has that kind of freedom. He is sovereign. Well, this is a very interesting illustration. Isaiah 10, 5 to 12. God introduces now Assyria. And Assyria is a godless nation, pagan, idolatrous. And he introduces this empire in a very interesting way. Verse 5. Woe to Assyria. When you read the word woe, it means judgment is coming to you. That means I will punish you. That means I have something for you, which is judgment. Okay. Assyria is under judgment by God. Why? But first of all, Jesus, I mean, God said, the rod of my anger and the staff in whose hands is my indignation. In other words, God was saying, I'm going to use you, Assyria, as my weapon. I am angry. I am angry. I'm going to use you as my weapon, my staff in my hands. I'm going to judge you, but at the same time, he identifies Assyria as the rod of his anger, a weapon in the hands of God. The question is, on whom is God going to use Assyria? Well, verse 6. You will be surprised. Verse 6. I send it against a godless nation. Question. Who is this godless nation? Who? Israel. This time, God identifies his own people who were very idolatrous as a godless nation and commissions it against the people of my fury. He's going to use Assyria as a weapon to punish his own people, to capture booty, to seize plunder, to trample them down like mud in the streets. Lord, are you kidding? These are your people. Are you using this godless nation? To discipline your people? Yes, because I am angry, because they are idolatrous, because Assyria is my weapon. Did it happen? Yes, 722. Exactly what the Lord said, it happened. Assyria became the weapon of his anger. However, verse 7 is very interesting. Yet, it does not so intend, nor does it plan so in his heart. He was talking of Assyria. Assyria was just doing its own thing. He was trying to conquer many other nations in verse 9. 
And all of a sudden, here comes the sovereignty of God, and the Lord said, okay, do this to my people. And it says there, it was not even a plan. It was not part of the whole plan of Assyria to conquer Israel and to do all of these things against Israel. They were not in our plan. They were not in our mind. It was not part of our strategic planning. It was never in our heart. But the sovereignty of God said, I will use you. Include them in your plan. And they did. And they did exactly what God told them to do. But it was not their intent. It was not their plan. But they did. And you can read that in verse 9. Amazing, amazing. The sovereignty of God. At the same time, Ginsugo, Yaman in Assyria, to destroy his own people. Verse 12. It will be. When the Lord has completed all his work on Mount Zion, representing Israel and Jerusalem, he will say to the Assyrians, I will punish the fruit of this arrogant heart of the king of Assyria and the pomp of his haughtiness. Whoa, wait, 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 wait. You made them do it. You made the Syrians do it. And now you will punish them because they became arrogant, because they conquered Israel and plundered them and punished them. Now you will also punish them? Yes, because they have their own human responsibility too. Oh, oh. Oh. Verse 16. I'm going to send wasting disease under the glory of fire of kindle like a burning flame. The light of Israel will become a fire. His holy one of flame and burn and devour his thorn and briars in a single day. He will destroy the glory of his forest and fruitful garden, soul and body as when a sick man washes away and so on and so on. Amazing, amazing, amazing. Listen to this. God punishes a nation for doing what God made them to do. What's the explanation? I don't know. I don't know. Can I harmonize this? I cannot. But Assyria will also face the full responsibility for being so proud and arrogant. They were acting by the divine decree of God. At the same time, they bore full responsibility for what they did. Paano mo niya i-reconcile? And I can give you plenty of other illustrations. This is what we call the parallel realities of God. Human responsibility, divine sovereignty, they will always run parallel. They always have to be understood that way in your song. That's just the way it is. Whew. I spent nights trying to see this both. It will always be parallel to me. Maybe someday, just like the railroad trucks, digto na siya mag-meet when I see God face to face. But for as long as I am here on earth, I will just content myself that these two biblical truths will always be there. And I thank God it is there. I thank God because he has chosen me before the beginning of time. What about you? Do you thank God because he has chosen you before the beginning of time? We should. He has predestined me. He has called me. And the same thing for you. At the same time, I thank God that he has given me a free choice. And I made the choice to accept it. But I thank God for that. So I am not going to dwell into the deeper things of God. How am I going to address this? Turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 9. Verse 16. 
I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. 16. It does not therefore depend on man's desire or effort, but on God's mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, I raised you up for this very purpose, that I might display my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Therefore God has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy, and he hardens whom he wants to harden. Verse 19, one of you will say to me, then why does God still blame us for who resists his will? Now this one is a pill to swallow. But who are you, O oh man, to talk back to God? Who are you? Shall what is formed say to him, who formed it? Why did you make me like this? Does not the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay some pottery for noble purposes and some for common use? How many shape, yeah? Because the manufacturer said, This is your shape. This guy cannot complain. Cannot complain. I want you to be shaped like that. What if God, choosing to show his wrath and make his power known, bore with great patience the objects of his wrath, prepared for destruction? What if he did this to make the riches of his glory known to the objects of his mercy, whom he prepared in advance for glory? Let God be God. And I would like to end with this. The Apostle Paul, after writing Romans 9, Romans 10, and Romans 11, you should read this. He came to a point in his life which I would also like to take the same stand. You know, after looking at all of these things happening, the sovereignty of God, human responsibility, and who God is. Paul ended it with his doxology. And this is what he said, Romans eleven, thirty-three. Oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom of God and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgment and his path beyond tracing. I cannot, I cannot trace it. He ended up with that. Next verse. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Anyone here who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor that you were there to advise God that what he did was wrong and what he did was right? Who speak up? None. Verse 35. Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? God is not a debtor to anyone. Have you done anything for the Lord that God will repay you? Speak up. None. Then he says, dear, in verse 36, after all of these things, he cannot fathom the mind of God. Everybody, please stand. Can we all stand as we end this together with what the Apostle Paul said? This is the mind of God. We cannot fathom him. And so he ends with this. Everybody read it. For from him and through him and for him are all things to him be the glory forever and ever and ever. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand of praise. Let's settle that in our hearts like the Apostle Paul. No matter what you do, everything comes from him. No matter what you do, everything is going to be made through him. And everything that we do, everything will go back to him for one purpose and purpose alone. For the glory of God. What can man say to that except Amen and Amen? Lord, 
forgive us if we have been trying to fathom you and understand you. The more we know you, the more we now see that you are awesome. Whatever is happening in Afghanistan, you know why. Whatever is happening in this country, you know. Whatever is happening all over the world, you know. Whatever is happening in my family, you know. Whatever is happening in my personal life, you know you are sovereign. But also give us the grace to make our own choices. That we can make our choices right. Lord, you are awesome. We just want to end this morning by saying thank you for being our God. We love you, dear God. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people say, Amen and Amen. You may be seated now.